Nights along the riverside, on the boulevard that cuts in front of Prime Minister Hun Sen's sprawling urban castle, along a stretch of land that, a few years ago, was still unpaved, something happens. On the same avenue, you can find concessions to the increasing wealth of the nation, a children's playground, new and brightly painted. A few kilometers away, other children still live in the public dump, refuse of a human variety, dropped by parents to fend for themselves when food or care can no longer be provided. A few blocks down, a high-end vegan restaurant. Throughout the country, if you cannot get meat for your meal, there is not a fancy name for what you eat instead except poverty, no decorating scheme to describe the modernist look of emptiness, an accidental luxury. Further on, a fountain that blasts water in time to American and British rock music with blaring and brilliantly colored lights. It is unclear what this most recent sign of wealth is to emulate. Like the rest of the attractions along the strip of newly paved land, the fountain is weird but delightful. Pointless, inspiring, tacky. So decidedly un-Cambodian that it could exist nowhere else in the world besides Cambodia. Along this entire stretch of boulevard, to an audience of street vendors, tourists, diners, and gawkers, Khmer Rouge survivors emerge from their homes as dusk gathers. They take places in front of the Prime Minister's house, a former Khmer Rouge member himself who switched affiliations thereafter with every popular political party that came along. It is under his watchful eye and stern hand that the press does not reveal Khmer Rouge atrocities, that the courts do not pursue living members of the Khmer Rouge, that the history books do not teach the Khmer Rouge regime, that no one talks about it. But night after night, survivors come and know. A group of attractive young men stand in front of neatly organized rows of middle-aged people, the new middle class, evidence that things change. The young men are known to perform a certain set of synchronized dances when they are on TV and do the same set of dances in concert, or, if you want, you can hire them to perform at your own event. Right now, they stand in front of an entire generation of survivors of starvation and forced labor and mass killings. This occasion, too, calls for the same dance moves. These young men are the new guard. They like hip-hop. The older folks behind them remember the opsera from before. This traditional dance is more subtle than ballet, the costumes more elaborate. Court dancers were the nation's first celebrities. The young men teaching the country new moves are the most recent. The sprightly fellows study dance moves from Korean and Thai music videos, but their students' bodies remember everything. The generation of survivors moves to new, aggressive beats slowly, gracefully, in gestures so deliberately aching and exquisite they turn into something else, beauty. Opsara dancing in Cambodia 50 years ago felt to viewers like breakdancing still does now. Unbelievable, painful, amazing. One dance from before the time that is not talked about, one from after. Combined, they succinctly outlined what happened between an absence made present. Fluid, but janky. Now that these two dances form one set of movements most evenings, along this newly paved boulevard, all is right in the world. It will just take some time to understand how.